series. Uh, they were called mile markers. We had one sermon on that uh, two Sundays ago. And uh, this Sunday we're going to continue that. Mile markers, so those are the little green signs that we see on the side of the road that let us know how we're progressing on our trip. And uh, as I mentioned in my first sermon, my goal with this is to uh, give us some measuring stick or some, some way to kind of say, how are we doing? Not in a, not in a uh, comparison way to one another, but to, to get a sense of, am I progressing in my faith? Or have I kind of pulled off to the side of the road and just gotten comfortable and I'm just kind of taking a nap? And, uh, you know, I, I, need to, I need somebody to come along and, and, and encourage me to keep moving, keep moving forward. Uh, Dave referred to it as going down, going deeper. Um, uh, th in this one, we're talking about kind of continuing down the road uh, as we journey with Jesus. And so, uh, you know, for some of us, it might be, you know, we get to one of these mile markers, and, well, I'm glad you preached on that because I feel like my faith is kind of stalled right there. That's the one that, that I seem to, I'm not progressing past, and, and we can help out with that. Hopefully we encourage you and send you on down the road with a little more um, spring in your step. And uh, like I mentioned in my first sermon, I hope you all feel as welcome uh, here at this church as uh, my friend Don Brown at the Brown Family Reunion, if you remember that story. Well, the title of my sermon for today, I, uh, I'm calling it the Good Sam Club. And are you familiar with this organization, the Good Sam Club? I see a few hands up there. Uh, if you've done any traveling on the back roads of America, you've probably seen this, this logo on the back of campers and RVs. It's the International Organization. Uh, I learned a lot about this organization this week. Uh, it's an international with over a million members. Uh, their goals are to make uh, RVing uh, safer, more enjoyable for its members. Uh, they uh, help save the, their members money by uh, club endorsed benefits and services. Uh, for example, there are 1,700 campgrounds in America that are endorsed by uh, the Good Sam Club. And these parks have been kind of checked out by the club to make sure they have certain amenities and standards. And, and they usually offer discounts to their, to their members. Well, interestingly enough, I did not, was not aware of this. Some of you might say, well, it seems pretty obvious, Pastor, but you know, once in a while you, you miss something, but maybe you didn't know either. But the Good Sam Club, if you didn't know, gets its name from the Bible. Uh, you know, there's a story that Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan who finds the, the man who was beaten on the side of the road and helps him out. Uh, you know, it's a traveler who has been uh, injured and another traveler helps them, uh, takes him to the, to the hotel and heals his wounds and takes care of him. And that's where the Good Sam uh, logo name comes from. Uh, it's short for Good Samaritan. Uh, and I think as we journey with Jesus, as we do this life together, as we progress down the road, uh, we all want to be good Sams. We all hope we have the good Sam logo on our back as we motor through life. Uh, and we want to help people, and many times we do. And I know this is a, a, a very helpful and giving church, but I know from talking with some of you, I can speak for myself, sometimes the needs are just overwhelming. You know, pastors get requests, like everybody else, uh, to help with people who are going on missions pro projects. You get requests for benevolence funds, there are marriages and people starving all across the world and even in America. Uh, there's Christian Children's Fund, there are needs in Haiti and uh, countries around the world need, uh, need help, missionaries need support, children need adopting, the unborn needs my help, uh, homeless, poor, uh, the unemployed, the underemployed, uh, minorities, uh, seniorities, on and on and on. The needs just seem to be endless. It could be overwhelming. Uh, I'll just speak for myself, but I, I'm sure this is a, a universal feeling. But, you know, the needs are real, 
we know these, these needs are out there and it's important. And oftentimes you hear people say, man, if I had a million dollars, you know, if I just won the lottery, boy, I would help all these great organizations happen. Uh, so we want to help. We see that they're worthy of help and the needs are real. Uh, and then if you're a, a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, you have uh, a biblical mandate to help people, right? And that kind of brings us to our scripture for today. Uh, we're going to be looking at James chapter 2. As I always do, uh, when we go through a book like this, I encourage you to read the chapter of the week. So, you know, like I mentioned, I won't be here next week. But for the following week, read James 3. Uh, this week we're in James 2. And uh, we're looking at verses 14 to 24. I'm just going to read that to you, and then we're going to kind of go through it step by step. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself that does not have works is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your, your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Here's the example he gives. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? as he offered up his son Isaac on the altar, you see that faith was active among his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. Well, uh, I had some of you share with me as we started this series, and, and I mentioned that we're going to be in James. Uh, somebody shared, I forget who exactly now, shared. We, I didn't like this book of James. We studied this a while back, and it's troubling. And this, this section is probably the section that most Christians uh, have a difficult time with. So let's take a look at it. You know, a cursory reading of this uh, leaves us a little puzzled. Um, Especially for those of us who believe that faith alone saves. But, you know, like I said, a little closer look will reveal that this is, this is not a statement against the importance of faith, but rather it's a comment <clears throat> on the proof, <coughs> excuse me, the proof of that faith. So let's take a look at um, verse 18. It says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, I think it's interesting that James starts off kind of reversing the tables a little bit. You would think James, as the author of this, <clears throat> would be the one saying, uh, you know, my works are what I want you to look at. But he starts off by saying, if someone said, <clears throat> you have faith, I have works, so he's kind of putting the, the, uh, the onus on the other person. It's really impossible to uh, demonstrate faith, show faith, without works, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you can, you can say you have faith, but if there's no works that go along with it, uh, some sort of result of your faith, it seems it seemed to me that your faith is really just kind of head knowledge at that point. I mean, I like to say that faith is an action verb, kind of like kicked. You know, you can say, I kicked the ball. But if you've never kicked the ball, you know, it, it's, it doesn't do any good to, sit, to say, I, I believe I've kicked the ball. Well, when you, once you kick, have kicked the ball, then you're being truthful, and then your faith, your, your, your words have meaning to you. Verse 19 says, uh, you believe that God is one. You do well. 
Even the demons believe and shudder. And I can't tell you how many people I've had conversations with who, uh, you know, we begin to have a spiritual conversation and they'll say, oh, I, I believe in God. I believe there's a God. No, I believe there's a God. This is, this is some kind of badge of honor. I mean, even the demons believe that God exists, right? Uh, intellectual assent, agreement that, yep, that's a good starting point, but it doesn't really accomplish anything towards saving faith. It would kind of be like saying, I'm starving, <clears throat> and I believe there's a sandwich in that refrigerator. But not going over and getting the sandwich out of the refrigerator. Your belief in what is in fact true, there is a sandwich in the refrigerator, right? So what? Until you put shoe leather to your faith and go, you know, your belief that there's a sandwich in there, and you go over and open the refrigerator and you eat it, it doesn't do you any good. That's kind of what, what uh, James is saying here. And it would also, you know, if you said, I'm starving and I believe there is a, is a sandwich in the refrigerator, uh, but you never went over and got it, people who are observing you would begin to wonder, I don't think he really believes that there's a sandwich in the refrigerator, because if he did, he'd go get the sandwich, right? And it's the same thing with us. We can say, oh, I, I believe there's a God, but if there's never any works that go along with that, if there's never anything... People would begin to wonder, I don't know, he, he talks a good game. You hear people say this, you know, he talks a good game, but I, I don't see any, says he's a Christian, he says he believes in God. I don't see any proof of that. You know, that would be problematic. Um, so James goes on in verse 20, he says, <clears throat> Do you want to be shown? I can grab some water, excuse me. <laughs> From those dry days. Context. And as I was thinking about the importance of context, 
um, and made me think of um, an argument that I heard uh, every two weeks in my home growing up. My dad was a traveling salesman, and he'd be gone a week and home a week, gone a week and home a week. So they didn't have the argument when he was home, and then he'd be gone another week, and then after that two week period, he'd come home. And they, my mom and dad would have this argument. <clears throat> and my dad had been away for a week, eating at restaurants all the time, right? So he was sick of restaurants, and restaurant food. My mom had been home with all of us rotten kids, uh, cooking home, you know, homemade meals for us. And she was tired of cooking. She wanted to go out to eat. My mom, if you've ever met my mom, <clears throat> to go out to eat was the, her greatest joy, you know. And so uh, when he would come home, he'd greet everybody. And within about 10 minutes, my mom would say to him these exact words. Wouldn't you like to go out to eat? <clears throat> and my dad would say, no. I wouldn't like to go. You know, I've been, I've been eating that all week. And my mom would, you know, burst into tears and say, you know, I've been here all week with these kids and they're driving me crazy and cooking meals and I'm just tired and I'm sick of all this, you know. And my dad would say, oh, if you would like to go out to eat, I'll take you out to eat. No, no, you're ruined it. It's not, no, you know, it's no good now. And they know she'd storm off or whatever. And we kids would watch this every two weeks for years. And we were like, Dad, have you met this woman? <laughs> she, you know what she's saying. She's saying, when she says to you, would you like to go out to eat? Because that's what you would key in on. When you ask, do I want to go out to eat? No, I don't want to go out, but I will take you out. Dad, come on. Context. You've been married for 30 years. You know this woman loves to go out to eat. You know every two saying, do you want to go out to eat? She's saying, please take me out to eat. Just overlook the fact that she asks, do you want to go out to eat? And understand what she's really communicating. Context is so important. So this scripture, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, can be taken all of a sudden if it's out of context that, whoa, this is, this is new news for all of us who believe that we are saved by faith alone. This is troublesome. Right? But if you take it in context, it's not a big deal at all. Because don't forget the last word in that sentence, and that's the word alone. In context of what we've read so far, we can see that this is a statement that's part of a greater discussion that James is having on the importance of works as a proof of our faith. And the last word here, alone, really re-emphasizes that fact. Some uh, churches that I won't name uh, might, uh, might uh, really like to emphasize or wish this verse said, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith. And not by faith, period. But James includes the word alone. And in the context, we see that you know faith is key, but it's, it's never alone. Uh, I wish I had said this, a very good, memorable thing to say, uh, but somebody said, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. Faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. There's going to be some outward action, there's going to be some works that James is talking about here, that follows our faith. Faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. The, the teacher's Bible commentary put it this way. Um, I'm, I'm calling to a higher source, kind of like James does with, with Abraham. A genuine faith is one that is actively at work. Paul said, the works of the law could never save a man. James says that the works of faith are proof of salvation. Abraham's faith was not an empty profession but a principle of action. Just as Abraham showed his faith by his willingness to offer Isaac, faith and works cannot exist separately and alone. They must go together. So, yeah, that idea that genuine faith 
is faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. Well, how are we doing? That's the question of the day. How are we doing? This is a mile marker on our on our journey with Jesus. Um, are we progressing? Is this a place where we're kind of stuck? Um, how are we doing at having our faith and our works going together? Uh, well, you know, as you look at, at the entire tapestry of Christianity around the world, uh, it's kind of a good news, bad news situation, right? Where if you really think about it, Christianity is doing an amazing amount of good works. Think about the hospitals that are out there, the ministries that are serving the homeless and the, and the unemployed and the, you know, the prison ministries and on and on and on. There are so many good things happening. The bad news is the world, the, those, those folks who are not insiders, who are not part of the church, they tend to think we're doing a lousy job. You know, uh, I might step on some toes with this one. Uh, forgive me in advance if I do. Um, John Lennon wrote a song called Imagine. Uh, I mentioned that I like the Beatles. Imagine is my least favorite song of all time. I can't stand the song. Because the premise of the song is, oh, if we could just get rid of this God concept. Imagine there's no heaven. No hell below us. No just get rid of, finally we could we could live in utopia. It's this it's this God concept that's holding us back. And I just when I when I hear that song, I just want to, I would love to see an you know like a, a an overall view of some big city or the world or something, and see all the you know St. Mary's, St. Luke's, and all the hospitals, all the ministries that are, that are doing all the good work in our world vanishing. You know, imagine if they were all gone. I think this place would be better. No, it would not. Uh, you know, so it's um, kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, how are we doing? So I think the world thinks that oftentimes how we're doing with our, our matching our good works to our to our faith that we're doing poorly. In fact, I think we're doing pretty well, but we can always do better, of course. And then the question becomes, well, how are we doing locally? Uh, I know this church is giving, gives to uh, a lot of different places, uh, has uh, asked us to give to, the, to what's going on in the Ukraine and different places. Uh, other ministries that have come last Sunday, we heard from a ministry that we support. Um, all, all good things. Um, you know, James even says here in verse 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, without giving them the things that are needed uh, for the body. What good is that? You know, it's, again, it's this idea that you say you have faith, but I'm not seeing any actions. I think we're helping brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, our, we're, we're helping them out of the bounty that we experience. If, you've been, if you're born and live in America, believe me, you are back, you are blessed. Um, and we need to continue to help those around us. But I think sometimes if you're like me, and I know I am, I know that. Um, sometimes I think we can get overwhelmed by the, by the needs that are out there, by the requests that we get. Uh, I, I think sometimes it, it just becomes too much for us. And I think there's another element to this too, and it's kind of a humorous element in that we, um, We've heard this before where people will say, uh, you know, maybe when you were a kid you would ask a teacher or a coach for some kind of favor, and they would say, if I help you, I have to help everyone, right? And I always wanted to say, no you don't. You're in charge here. Just help me. You don't have to help everyone. Just help me. And, um, you know, I think we, this comes out of a, a desire to be fair, which is a strange concept, fairness. Um, I mean, dad wasn't fair, mom's not fair, God's not fair, you know, in the strictest sense. What do we tell our kids? Life is not fair. But for some reason, when we get so many requests, all of a sudden, we, one of the excuses we give is, 
Well, if I help them, I've got to help everybody. And uh, I've got a little cure for that today. So, what I want to suggest is um, doing something different, and it's summed up by this, this phrase. Start small and pray for all. Start small, but pray for all. Um, if you're ever, if you're already helping out in places, that's great. Continue to be generous. Uh, if you're getting more and more invitations to help, uh, and you just kind of write them off because you can't do it for everybody, and it seems like the world has an endless supply of needs, start small, pray for all. Find that one teenager who needs you. Find that one marriage that can use some encouragement. Find that one group that needs a leader and pitch in and help them. Help them. In the future, you know, we as a church, I'm sure we'll begin to offer uh, ministries and areas, things of service that we can do in our community. And you might begin to feel like, man, my plate is full. I don't, I don't know if I can take on all these things that, that the church is offering as ways to serve. Remember this? Take Start small, pray for all, take on one thing, and follow these, these principles. I'm going to offer four quick principles before we close. One is go with uh, quality rather than quantity. You know, sometimes it's easier to feel like we're being very generous when we, when we say yes to 15, 20 different ministries. But I want to encourage you to go for quality rather than quantity. Get involved with the rather than supporting everything that comes across your plate. Pick a few things that you really have a passion for, that you want to get involved with, where you can um, and can be a part of things. You know, Paul in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 8 says that he not only shared the gospel with these Thessalonians, but he imparted his very life also. And uh, I know as a person who was a missionary for 25 years, uh, and supported by other people. I loved it when people got involved with my ministry and would, would at least send me a note and say, hey, I prayed for you today. Uh, there were times when people actually showed up and helped me uh, do ministry. That was great. But uh, it, it was very encouraging just to hear from you. Uh, the second thing is I want to encourage you as you're involved in demonstrating your faith through works, uh, and you're involved in different ministries, hang in there. Hang in there. Stick with people in ministries rather than hopping from one thing to another. Be a part of someone's life. Uh, don't just serve here and there and jump around like popcorn. You know, perseverance is a virtue. Uh, hang in there with people that you really feel like God is using and, and stick with them even through the dry time which, by the way, all ministries go through the dry times. And stick with them and encourage them. Thirdly, give, of your, give yourself, not just your finances. Uh, ministries need you to invest in them financially, no doubt about it. It's a great way to lay up treasures in heaven. But, don't, uh, but it doesn't give you a chance to get involved and be changed in growing your faith through that involvement. Uh, find find your niche, figure out what your gifts are, we've talked about that here before, uh, and, and figure out where God's calling you into ministry. You know, my one of my themes that you'll hear me sort of uh, touch on over and over again from the pulpit here is that we all need to have our own ministries. Uh, ministry is where it happens. You know, be saying, uh, you know, teaching you about the scripture, great, love to do it, very important, but as we take that and we get into some ministry and you're each going to have different versions of that than I have, that's great, uh, that's where growth really happens, because when you get to really trust God, pray for needs, and see Him come through, and celebrate His victories, and mourn with those who are mourning, celebrate with those who are celebrating. And man, that's when, when our faith really begins to grow. And the last thing that, that's important to do if you're going to really have a life that demonstrates your faith to the world 
is to slow down. Slow down. Uh, ABC News did a study uh, a while back to see how likely people are to be good Samaritans. Okay? They even used that term. Uh, they recruited a group of people and told them they were auditioning for a role on television. And they then pretended to randomly, well, let's pick a topic here out of this bowl. And all the topics in the bowl were the story of the Good Samaritan. Ah, oh, the story of the Good Samaritan. Here, read that. And then uh, we'd like you to uh, kind of extemporaneously tell us that story back and what it means to you, what do you really think about that kind of thing. Uh, the person read the story, talked about it briefly, and was told to walk a short distance, kind of a half block down, turn, go another block down, and there you'll find the television cameras, and uh, that's where you'll do your audition. But unbeknownst to them, ABC News had uh, hired an actor to pretend to be in distress right around the corner. So as they went around the corner, they ran into this person who clearly needed some help. Some of the participants were told that they needed to be in a hurry. Well, oh, they're waiting for you right now. Rush over there and quick to your, uh, do your audition. Others were, were told, that's where you go. Just walk over, no rush. Whenever you get there, that's fine. The researchers found that being rushed caused uh, changed people's actions. Get a load of this. 80% of those who had the time stopped and helped people while only 30% of those who were in a rush stopped to help this person who was clearly in need. Time pressure was the only thing that determined whether a participant would stop and help a stranger. The article went on to say that other research showed that it's possible to make anyone disregard the needs of others if enough pressure was introduced. I think this is one of the great schemes of the end of our enemy uh, is to get our lives, people in America, get us so busy that we just we just don't have time to to help people who need who need help. And our our good works that, that James is encouraging us to, to show begin to drop off because we're just too busy. So I want to encourage you to take some time. To say no to some things and slow your life down a little bit and um, see if that doesn't uh, parallel this research that when you have some time in your life, uh, a little boundary, a little, little area where you can say yes, you'll probably say yes more. Well, that's, that's kind of our mile marker for the week, good works. It's an important one that can really validate our faith. It can uh, show our faith to others, and it can really um, combat this theme that we hear from the world that you say one thing and you're doing another thing. You say, you know, you follow Jesus, but hey, his whole thing was love your neighbor. I don't see it. Taking the time, moving past this uh, mile marker can address all those things. Well, um, if we don't see those good works in our lives, we might even begin to wonder about our faith. James would have some uh, words of warning uh, for us if we claim to be Christians, but we don't have the good logo, the, the good Sam logo on our back. So let's pray together and um, see what God has for us. Lord, thank you so much for your word from James. Thank you for the encouragement and reminder that our, our faith, our intellectual ascent, that you are who you say you are, Jesus is who he says he is, that he uh, can do what he says he can do in our lives. That's great. That's a great starting point. But Lord, our, our words and our actions need to uh, show proof of that uh, so that we can have confidence that, uh, that our faith is real. And so we can show the world that our faith is real and makes a difference. Lord, we ask that you would uh, help us to go from here changed and different and committed to, uh, to doing those good works so that uh, others might know you and see you in our lives. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.